All right, we're live. Cool. So, um, hey everybody, this is Mike. I'm at home today, and we have the X Core Aerospace talk um, going on at Columbia Startup Lab, and we have hey, some ready? people over there that are going to try to help us um, broadcast that event. So, hey, Chris. So, how long is this? We just started. Uh, a couple months ago. We started that, yeah. Oh, the startup also actually started a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah September. That's great. Yeah, it's an initiative like sponsored by the near school. The environments. So this Mike is our Michael. Michael. Communications web guru. Hey guys. Sound. You don't have sound? And then if the have to oh there's just the volume on your face uh just turn it up. Yeah, I can hear you guys fine. Okay, it's most important. Right? Okay, we got more than I think the pure speakers are better. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not very powerful. Let me see. So, if you need to, if you'd like to ask a question or an orientation, you might have to shout. <laughs> All right. Okay. No problem. You feel better? Very background, um, and, and I'll preface by saying that uh, anyone in our company who is over 35 did not come to this through aerospace engineering. Um, in fact, our, so our chief engineer is a mechanical engineer. Our, uh, our CEO is an uh, electrical engineer. We just have a passion for space. So I happen to be a writer. I happen to be a proposal writer, a technical writer, and I uh, worked at Lamont Doherty for a while, and I was operations, I was operations manager of um, a contract head with NSF uh, for part of the ocean drilling program, mm -hmm. um, and then actually went to architecture school, um, wrote a thesis about building stones mm -hmm. in New York because geology can building stones, um, and then moved to California in 2004, and XCorp was looking for a proposal right and that just happens to be my skill set, and, you know, written a lot of proposals. I helped uh, my boss at the time at, at, at Lamont um, write a was like $34 million DOE proposal, um, which he got, and Roger Anderson was his name, started something called the Global Basins Research Network. Um, among other things, among other proposals, stuff like that, all the way down the line. So, um, found XCore that way, and also had had operations management experience. And you know, when I when, when I started writing proposals and we started getting contracts, I then said to the engineers, "Hey, you know, I can I can see this contract through because essentially." Your deliverable is a report, right. and you know I can't stress you how crucial writing is. Yes. You know, I mean, if you all are in grad school, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's basically all you do. Um, so they said, absolutely take it. You know, the engineer says, you want to be program manager? Fine, you take it. And as the company grew, and as we developed, and as we started looking at our markets, we realized. You know, we, we could, well, the engineers were developing the vehicles 
anyway to not only take people, but to take what we call payloads. Mm -hmm. what, what I call research education missions. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, scientists, researchers, educators, kids, students can build a payload and put that payload on the vehicle. And this is a whole different methodology than just you know, somebody coming in with their checkbook and going, I want a flight. Mm -hmm. and primarily, the scientists get their money from government agencies, mm -hmm. as do the teachers. Um, or you have researchers in large corporations. Totally different structure. Um, and so they, they tasked me with this, this job of director of payload sales and operations. And so I've been leading that charge. And for the most part, it's just, it's just um, getting people aware of the capabilities. And I remember sitting down with someone, and he said, no. You're making me realize that this commercial space flight is not just for billionaires. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's 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 for you know it's for the science, but it's also for instrumentation development. I mean, you you know, you there's nothing right now that exists that you can develop. You know, a, a, a space-based instrument. Or, or, or not, or just you know have a have a an instrument fly into microgravity and get some calibrations and then and then do it again. So 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 suborbital provides the ability to close that gap between say ground-based or low what I call low altitude parabolic flights or uh, airborne. Um, Performance flight. I mean, NASA flies those. NOAA flies those right now. Um, to something that you can put on ISS with very little risk. So whether it's your instrument, whether it's your experiment, to be able to fly it in the suborbital environment and get to a place where the government calls TRL, Technology Readiness Level, um, TRL eight or nine, which is which is the very top. Is is going to become crucial because you you, know, you want to do risk assessment, risk reduction on this hardware before you put it into space. Okay, so it's basically your experiments that you are like right now you want to want to take as a payload are the ones that in future will be part of the aircraft or other. No, no, not necessarily. I mean, so, so that, that's that's one aspect. Of it. Another aspect is the science, is to truly do science. So, the atmospheric scientists, for example, call. So, this suborbital vehicle is going to get to 100 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So that's 330,000 feet. Mm -hmm. The atmospheric scientists call this region, the mesosphere, lower thermosphere, which is about 50. 50 to 100 kilometers, they call it the ignorosphere, because we have not been able to reach that altitude yet. Okay. There's nothing that goes there. Sounding rockets go right through it. You have balloons, high altitude balloons, that, that get um, just below, but nothing is there. <laughs> and so, you know, you you just you, you have that ability to actually get in there, take in situ measurements. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to change. It's going to change atmospheric science. It's going to change the way we, we do it. Atmospheric science is going to change the way we think about atmospheric science. That's just one aspect of it. I mean, there's multiple applications. There's uh, microgravity research, which you can do for in biomedicine, in life sciences, in space physics. Uh, we have experiments that are going up that are going to do uh, solar physics, you know, examining, actually looking at the sun from a suborbital platform. There's an organization called Planetary Science Institute that is developing, literally developing, a suborbital observatory. So a suborbital astronomical observatory. Gets them off the ground, so, you know, in the event that there is a transit that they need to see, or an eclipse, or there's some aspect up in space. Well, I don't know how many times you've, you've watched some poor guy who's standing in the middle of nowhere, Australia, and waiting for this eclipse to happen, 
And then in standing, I'm going, you know, we can't see anything because we have clouds. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're in suborbit, you don't have that ability. Plus, you don't have you don't have to, to compete or propose for say Hubble time. You know, which is which is very precious and you know very much um, dictated by NASA. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is co commercial operations. The whole point of commercial spaceflight is to give everyone access. So if you come to us and you say, "I want to do this," and I have, you know, I have the money, we could do it within months, mm -hmm. as opposed to right now, years. And, and we can guarantee you that you get up there. Question. What's the typical time span of one of these experiments that will go up into suborbital? Well, this our suborbital flight is going to be 30 minutes. Okay. So they'll go up, come down. Um, we could fly four times a day. So you know, you, you, if you have an instrument, if you have an experiment, you, you need to get multiple data sets, mm -hmm. you have that ability. Or you have the ability to, to calibrate them. I know when I was working with Ocean Drilling Program, you're out at sea for two months, and there's, I, I, I don't want to say there's no way to get replacement hardware, but it's very difficult. You know, you, you just, if you're in the middle of the ocean, you probably SOL. Of course. But this gives you that advantage of you know, you're going up, 30 minutes, you come back down, okay, if something didn't work, let's fix it, right. let's go back up again. You, so you mentioned there's that company that was uh, starting kind of an observatory, some sub yeah. observatory. So are you, doing, are you working with them, uh, planetary sciences? Are you, are you working with them, and does that mean doing like frequent flights into suborbital? Right now, yeah, we're working with them on multiple levels. We're working with them to, to support them in their fundraising. We're working with them to... Um, Design their equipment right now. They're they're developing a prototype hardware that that actually. Um, I'm actually I'm give you my card and show you the end. What they what they want to do at the, at the end. So this is a bonus because my my contacts it's on the back there. But but this is so vehicle that you see here is, um, we call that the Lynx Mark III. And Lynx Mark III has a pod on top of it. Lynx Mark I is a prototype vehicle. And so PSI is developing their prototype instrumentation that affixes to the side of the cockpit. And it will be what we call human-tended. They, they will have an operator sitting in that right seat. And it's, it's a small vehicle, so it's, it's two people. The pilot, pilot plus one, in that right seat will be a PSI mission specialist who is just operating the camera, just looking at the pointing accuracy, pointing aspects, resolution, in anticipation for this this larger telescope. And that's you know, and that's again mm -hmm. by bringing the cost down, you you can afford to do this incremental development. Right. Uh, which I think is is very important. Um, so I know we were also say. looking at, on a website called uh, Citizens in Space previously, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they mentioned using uh, links link ships to take little CubeSat experiments. Like yeah, this, this they developed. Cargo. Yeah, they developed this thing called they called the Cub Carrier. Right. <laughs> um, and it fits beneath the, the pilot, right? Behind the pilot, and behind the pilot, it's a, it's a regular shape, sort of a triangular shape. And we've realized you can fit about 15 You can multiple students sure. experiments, you know, whether they're in students or student groups. And again, you know, I can't, I mean, edgy, the Opportunities for education to of course. for students to build payloads and put payloads into space. And we're working with a fit outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. If somebody had told me when I was 11 years old that I could fly something into space, I would have been in the front of the class. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's do this. 
you know, so so now, you know. It's like and, marshmallows in space or something. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I mean, and that's the beauty of it. It's like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell these kids what they. I'll, I'll give them the parameters. I'll tell them, you know, why you, you know, yeah, you can't you can't put uh, fuming nitrous oxide in in one of these boxes. But you know, you could put goldfish. I mean, whatever. You could put any almost anything, and that just expands the imagination of the kid. Also, is very much missing, and you lose a lot of girls. You you lose some boys. Um, who could be engineers, great mathematicians. Um, they 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 can get engaged. So give them that hand on. This focus on space, like what sets export apart from the reason why space has to be. Well, what sets export apart is, is, you know, we are the billionaire. We're founded by some four very working people who want to go to space, but I take everyone with them. So um, instead of going straight to our end, and each one of us has given us a that we applied to this vehicle. I think that's the base of the portal. No. It's like a new pile, that's one of their. No, they wouldn't. Yeah, our. our and um, you know, but but we're gonna you know we're from from like, so we're also finding that there's a there's a support market, mm -hmm. a very support market, and um, it's there's a lot of NSRC next generation support resources that are yeah. It's 13, but they did it again this year. There's there's three. Yeah, they were they were they were ten years past, but last year was 2013. So yeah, 20, 12, and 13. Yeah, uh, you know, it actually actually was when it was June. Yeah, it was June. We brought a lot of um, there. But what they're doing is, is the next one so, um, in June. What we found is, uh, and this was this was this was research institute. He used to be an associate administrator at NASA, and he's now I remember in um, the New Horizons, and he's actually the principal investigator for the New Horizons project to go going to Pluto. Um, but in there, he is a beautiful program space flight science. And so he set up this meeting. Well, what he found was the first meeting, I think there were 100 people. The second meeting, there were 200 people. The third meeting, there were 400 people. So you know, it's just grown incrementally, exponentially, yeah. and and you know, I I remember I couldn't I couldn't be a scientist. I have this idea. It's because you guys are us because we're so. <laughs> so, but it's actually, it's actually for us, it's been very useful to right now talk to these researchers. We are informing our designers, and they are our marketers. It's to go to them and say, who do you guys see? What do you need? So, they were saying, it's not just past very science and no gravity researchers, but yeah, planetary science is it really does 
stand. The story of astronomy didn't taste to be up that high above of the light pollution band. Absolutely. Um, yeah, because you can get the, I don't know, there is all kinds of radiation information. So, like, there's yes. all four. Yeah. And then there's going to be clouds right now. Right now. Is that the first? Yeah. So, we said about the the aircraft is going to take the seven like the higher structure to at the platform and then the models have to be available automatically made as soon as you reach the particular level of the space you should start getting this and then after some time of the whatever time they have the and then that. So how does that you can work it can like I said, it can be what we call human intended where you have the state where you see and they have the device behind the see where they can activate the sequence going on and sort of understand the pilot or the pilot that is what we call pilot actuation. So just hit the switch, turn it on, and yeah, that can be determined. That, that's determined by by the PI. Yeah. You know, he says, okay, you know, turn it on, it, you know, or you know, turn it on, whatever it is. Because we'll do a precision. And so. There's actually the experts like that aspect that they it doesn't have to be automated. Okay. I've had that before. You know, and, and right now you know, they're developing the, these these experiments they set up on a Mission to ISS, and they, they hope that the astronaut knows <laughs> how to work it. And, well, that's, that's, that's the second part. The first part is they hope it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope it works. They hope the astronaut knows what they're supposed to do. But I can tell you for a fact that the PIs are much better operating their own experiment. Okay. And that's the principal investigator. There's an awful lot of experiments that never make it because in the same place, you can get the line of Orion, you can see it can be wind, it can, so there's a million different kinds of weather, can cause it can be that whole thing. So sometimes your experiment expires while it's waiting, or sometimes the rocket gets lost. Um, and then, you know, once it finally gets there, you have to use the way that the astronauts can understand the human error. Can go. So, to be able to fly something much about what Right. 
If it's not a vertical launch rocket, it's a horizontal launch. So it's horizontal, the rocket's flat on and it just blocks up. Yep, yeah. And you know, we're to the space shuttle, which is on the from launch The space shuttle was also going on the point there. And this is, and it's not going into orbit. It's a cost of orbital environment. And it's reusable. So it so needs yeah. weight fuel. You know, it's like a vehicle. Yeah. yeah, but you know, on that, by that standard, so you don't get as high. So there's this parabola. You'll hang there for several minutes, and then gravity will bring you back down. Mm -hmm. And you go to the brain tree. If you look at, if you look at the uh, at the vehicle here, you you see the black stuff. Uh, engine, the thermal protection system. What is camera in there, he's going to see how they land. 
Exactly is like the extent of like when you say micro about like zero G specific in that spectrum. A thirty three the thirty where you it, it's gonna it's gonna vary. So it's gonna be it's gonna be driving on this ten line zero. So for the minus the minus one, not ten line zero and the minus one. Is okay. You're in environment. We're gonna get the experiments to at least ten to the minus five. Right? Five gravity environment. Yeah. So you're saying anywhere from like uh, one hundred, one over one hundred to like uh, G. And that, that, that's going to be sort of like, so you're kind of at the bottom of the problem here, and you're at the top of the problem here. So three minutes. So three minutes. Three, of, three, oh, okay. yeah, three minutes of microgravity. And microgravity times into, is from 10 to the minus 1 to at least the minus, even 10 to the minus 6. So that's, the, 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 that's the quality. And as we were saying, Right now, in what I was saying earlier, right now we have these parallel flights where you get microgravity time where from, say, 12 to 20 seconds in these, in these spurts. And that's not, that's not enough. That's the plane just, you, you can have multiple. Intervals. We've got uh, we've got a customer who's doing something kind of cool called a, a floating water bridge, and that's but you take two vessels, two sinkers filled with water. The first experiment was done with wine glasses. <laughs> get them in, in in close proximity to each other. You get them. An electrical charge, and water comes out of the glass. So each glass informs this water bridge. Mm. First of all, that was never supposed to happen. The microgravity part. they found in a in a centrifuge, but it did. And but also, yeah, it's another like spurts of seventeen minutes of microgravity. And another, what was uh, this bridge is starting for? And it holds for a little bit, and then it dissipates, and then it starts to form again, and then there's a oh. mm -hmm. So they don't know how long does this sustain. And, and these are two guys in the Netherlands. We're very much concerned with water. Mm -hmm. Over there, and so so they're looking at this as as we don't know a lot about. We know a lot about the mechanics, the biology, and other things, but we know a lot about water dynamics. Yeah. So here we go. Let's put it on the vehicle, and let's let's keep something more than 17 seconds to the microphone. The requirements for they to go with their experiments. Are you designing? Are you working with someone who say, This is how we know. How do you know that they are fit and trained? Yeah, and that's that's going to take um, a basic. Nicholm has people who thought we have followed space flights um, and we're regulated by the FAA. 
astronauts, it's not passengers. Um, it's not, um, so, you know, like, you know, if you get in an airplane and take off and land, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> these people recognize that this is a risky thing that they're doing, but it's no different than bungee jumping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so space has to, they have to pass what we call an FA. Uh, second class airmen, uh, they have to get a second class airmen license, which is not all that complicated. I mean, you have to be checked out, you know, you have to be able to to read and function in a, in a above the ground. Mm -hmm. um, now, while we can't, well, we, we will give Everyone who flies basic training. Just say basic training, uh, high performance aeroplane, aerobatic maneuvers, or um, now some fuse training kind of stuff. Um, but we are, and while I can't, we'll to go through extra training. It's, it's a no brainer. have no that requirement because they want to make sure that they can operate their experiment while they're there. So they think of it as training. Alan Stern and Dan Dirt at Southwest Research Institute have gone through NASA training, gone through training. Hey everyone, um, we're going to try to have Chris rejoin the Hangout um, to get a better connection going, so hopefully that works.